In my YouTube comments, I often get requests for various topics, and this video on arabinogalactins was one. I was already planning on doing it, I just bumped it up on the list of things to do. In addition, my videos on supplements are among my most popular ones. Perhaps this will be as well. Arabinogalactins can be useful for some people, but I also hesitate to use them in others, for reasons which you're about to discover. So let's take a look. If you're new, be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel and also follow me on Instagram and Facebook as The Microbiome Expert. Arabinogalactins belong to a major group of carbohydrates known as hemicelluloses, which are non-starch polysaccharides that occur abundantly in the primary and secondary cell walls of plant cells and are widely spread throughout the plant kingdom. Dietary sources of arabinogalactins include carrot, radish, pear, maize, wheat, and tomato, in addition to sources from medicinal herbs to include echinacea and turmeric. There are two commercial sources as a prebiotic, one from acacia and one pictured here from the North American larch tree. The structures can vary and thus their contribution to our health. For example, the larch source has no bound proteins, which is uncommon. Like all prebiotics, it's resistant to our enzymes and thus escapes digestion and becomes fuel for a microbiome. Arabinogalactins are long, densely branched, high molecular weight polysaccharides, which if you recall from my other prebiotics videos, complex prebiotics are advantageous as they take longer to ferment in the lower GI as opposed to, say, FOS, which will ferment quickly, which is an especially bad idea in those with SIBO. Arabinogalactin is composed of two sugars, D-galactose and L-arabinose, in a 6 to 1 ratio in the Western Larch, hence the name Arabinogalactin, although given the ratio it should be called something more like Galactoarabinose. Now, truth be told, there are very few papers where the fermentation of Arabinogalactins has been studied both in vivo and in vitro, to measure its effects on the microbiome. Much less than, say, pectin, arabinoxylans, resistant starch, and certainly nothing in comparison to inulin. See those videos. Here we have one of the few studies where, in an in vitro simulated gut environment, arabinogalactin was compared to FOS. FOS, as mentioned earlier, fermented more quickly and arabinogalactin, as a complex molecule, fermented more slowly. Both significantly increased bifidobacterium, as well as the superhero of the gut, F. prausitzii. See that video. However, only arabinogalactin was able to significantly increase the amazingly beneficial genus, Roseburia. From this paper, we highlight two points. One, in Table 5, we see significant increases in gas and bloating when using 30 grams of arabinogalactins. Now, my protocols, I on average use a bit more than 30 grams of prebiotics, but never only one type. I blend them to meet the needs of the individual microbiome. I also recommend ancillary supplements to support every angle of the microbiome. With that said, I warn everyone that I will probably make them gassy and bloated for two to three weeks, and they won't like me very much. But this is a necessary part of the process. My philosophy is different than the others. I aim to drive significant shift quickly in the environment of the microbiome, to one which favors the health motors for reasons I explain in my many videos. Point number two here is that of ammonia. You can read the quote in the box about how ammonia is toxic to the gut. This smelly toxin comes from bacterial protein fermentation, which you can learn more about in my videos on the carnivore and keto diets. Now in this study, the administration of both 15 and 30 grams of arabinogalactin significantly reduced fecal ammonia levels. Now how was this done? By changing the pH of the gut, which is a very important concept I discuss all the time and have a video dedicated to this topic. When the pH is more basic, ammonia can dominate and ammonia contributes to a basic pH because it itself is quite basic at a pH of 11. So the more protein you consume, the more that makes its way down to the lower GI, the more that gets fermented, the more ammonia, 
which is not only toxic, but makes the pH even more basic. But when conditions are more acidic, then ammonia accepts a proton and it becomes ammonium, which is an odorless, non-toxic substance, which is also slightly acidic. You want the colon to be slightly acidic in the Goldilocks zone for the health promoters where they can thrive. Again, see my video on pH. I hope you're enjoying the video so far. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and recommend to friends and family. Also, if you're feeling extra generous, hit the super thanks below. And here in this paper, we see more supportive data for pH. As the fermentation time increased with arabinogalactin, the pH dropped. And with that, butyrate increased significantly as well. As the short chain fatty acids, acetic acid, propionic acid, and butyric acid increase due to the bacterial fermentation, the pH becomes, no surprise here, more acidic. And we see things like this, where again, bifidobacterium and F. prausitzii increase. For one, they are provided with the fuels they love, and two, the environment is one where they can outcompete the bad actors. Now, it has been known for some time that large arabinogalactin is capable of enhancing natural killer cells and macrophages, as well as the secretion of pro-inflammatory cytokines. And in my personal experience, it sure seems to boost the immune response. We see here that in this study in regards to the common cold and how it reduced its incidence. In full disclosure, this paper was fully funded by Lonza, who makes the large tree resist aid product. But I find the data believable. However, the normal fermentation of other prebiotics does not have this exact same profile, especially the secretion of pro-inflammatory cytokines part. In fact, I often talk about the more tolerant T regulatory cell dominant immune system in a healthy microbiome. Another indication is this study, where the same resisted product, this time in Streptococcus pneumoniae vaccination, think pneumonia, was used. The results of this pilot study suggest that the arabinogalactin preparation had a selective immune stimulating effect on adaptive immunity, think antibodies. However, I often talk about how in the inflamed dysbiotic gut, parts of or whole bacteria can escape the gut along with food proteins, amino acid sequences slash epitopes, and this chronic exposure of ramping up the immune system can drive it to attacking your own tissues, autoimmunity. See those videos. So maybe all people at all times don't want their immune system upregulated. Similarly with echinacea, which is probably best avoided in autoimmune disease. So what's going on here? How is a supposedly simple prebiotic driving an immune response outside the normal feeding of butyrate producing bacteria? You can read the complex quote if you want, but basically it says that there is some molecular feature to arabinogalactins that plugs into one or more components of the immune system stimulating an immune response. And here we have a study looking at just that. So this is where it gets interesting. These researchers compared arabinogalactin to something called fucoidin and to LPS. If you're not familiar with my videos, LPS is what's called a PAMP, a pathogen-associated molecular pattern. LPS is dominant on the surface of gram-negative bacteria, which tend to be bad actors, but there are clearly exceptions. The body recognizes an invader and sets off the alarms by detecting LPS by what are called toll-like receptor 4. You can see how it's interesting here that they used LPS as a control, knowing the pro-inflammatory immune activation environment that it creates. Now, what's this thing called fucoidin? This too is a very interesting molecule, which, by the way, happens to exist in very high levels in seaweed for the longest lived people on the planet, the Okinawans. So here's more interesting news. Fucoidin binds to toll receptor 2 and toll receptor 4. toll receptor 2 also recognizes these PAMPs, other ones in LPS, other cell wall surface components like from pathogenic gram-positive bacteria and viruses and fungi. As you can see, the immune stimulation from LPS a well-known pro-inflammatory agent 
was roughly equal to or less than the immune stimulation for a fucoidin and a rabinogalactin. So what you get is the immune upregulation, but without the toxic exposure. The whys and wherefores are better established for fucoidin, and its immunostimulatory potential seems to be more regulated or tolerant than that of a rabinogalactin. But nevertheless, this is fascinating information. Now I realize that there are a million supplements out there, and how are you to know which is best for you, and at what dose, and in combination with what else? In my consultations with people from all over the world, they too have tried everything. Tons of supplements, all sorts of diets, of course, rounds of various pharmaceuticals, and ancillary options as well, such as infrared sauna, oxygen chambers, acupuncture, etc. And yet they find me because nothing has worked in the past. If you find yourself spinning in circles, continually searching for answers online, then maybe it's time you worked with someone who understands the science and has decades of experience. Not only the experience, but the results. As the former head of education for a microbiome firm, and now with my own platform, I have helped legions of people. Check out my videos and my testimonials. Once you're content with what you've seen, and if you think your microbiome may be tied to your health concern, which it probably is, then reach out. Nobody out there understands the microbiome and its connection to health like I do. That will become evident as you watch my videos. I challenge you to find content out there that even comes close to what I present. I've included over 1,000 scientific papers in one way or another in my videos. So stop following fads and start following the data. If you like the video, don't forget to subscribe. Also, somewhere around here, you can go to my website where you can schedule a consultation with me. You can also view the protocols. And here, you can watch the next video.